for tonight's speaker. It is my very great pleasure and honor to introduce Ward Silver, November uh, Zero Alpha X-Ray. I first met Ward through the Hamsi Collective a few years ago when I was wet behind the ears in this particular hobby, although I do spend my life dealing with uh, RF. Um, by the way, I apologize for not being at the club meeting in person, but I'm actually simultaneously running an NSF science workshop, so I have to hop back and forth. In any case, um, Ward, was very, Ward is very, was very kind to talk to us today about the Yasme Foundation, and I'm sure he will cover more about what that is and what it does in a moment. But I want to give you a tiny biography of Ward before I turn it over to him. Ward uh, has been an active amateur since novice class in 1972. He's been around the world in numerous locations in both contests as and as a DXer. And you will see Ward's name all over ARRL publications, certainly. Uh, he spent 20 years developing industrial and medical products. He happens to be the lead editor of both the ARRL handbook and the ARRL antenna book. He is also the author of all three ARRL license manuals and the Q&A study guides. He works quite closely with the NCVEC question pool committee that uh, changes the exam questions as needed and makes them appropriate and useful. Um, he has also written Wiley's uh, Ham Radio for Dummies, which I guess is in its second edition or perhaps a third. He's also fourth, fourth gracious. He's also written a very good book on grounding and bonding for the radio amateur, which dispels a lot of those myths about what you do about RF grounding and safety grounding. And uh, he was he's been a director at the ASME Foundation for a number of years. And in 2013, he was elected president. And he's good at enough at it that he is still the president of the Yasme Foundation. So really, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Ward, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about Yasme. So, as a side note, Phil, I've uh, met Ward many times out of Dayton. Yep. Um, his contributions to both the league and amateur radio are extensive. We could have a separate evening presentation just uh, highlighting some of those things. Yep. And if any of you play to play a musical instrument, I uh, I encourage you to go to Dayton and, and play with Ward and the spurious emissions who play at the uh, at the I don't know what the new hotel is going to be Ward, but uh, they used to play at the Crown Plaza year after year on Friday night. Was it? Yeah, the, the spurious emissions out of the band. Out of band, correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, with. With that, Ward, why don't you take it away? Okay, very good. Well, thanks for the great uh, introduction. And most of it seems to be true, uh, which is encouraging. And um, so tonight, uh, let's see, I guess uh, this second edition of Grounding and Bonding has just hit the warehouse at uh, HQ. So uh, there's some addition to that. And uh, and we're coming up on the 100th edition of the handbook next year uh, that will come out for 2023 and uh, kind of amazing. You know, when I was a kid, I read that book over and over and um, and here I am editing it. It's kind of a scary thought. Well, speaking of scary thoughts, let's see if I can share my screen. And I want this. OK, I want to share that and I want to go to slideshow. And from the beginning, so you should see a nice big Yasme Foundation slide. Is that we correct? Do. Yes, it looks good. Okay, very good. Okay, well, tonight's presentation, I'm going to talk about the history of Yasme, what it's doing today, and what our goals are, and um, explain what this foundation business is, and um, it, it ties into the history of DXing, and then it gets into uh, today's uh, grants and awards and programs like that. So without further ado, uh, everybody says, this is our first question, what the heck is a Yasme? Well, Yasme is the name of a boat. Uh, there were actually three, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. The name was derived from a Japanese word, Yasume, which is to make tranquil. And this uh, boat was owned by Danny Weil, whose original call sign was G7DW, and then he became Victor Papa II Victor Bravo uh, in his most famous incarnation. He was a, a young English um, 
a watchmaker and like a lot of young Englishmen uh, decided to go to sea. That seems to be quite a thing uh, in, the, uh, in the British Isles. So he bought a decrepit uh, yawl and rebuilt it and decided that he would sail across the Atlantic Ocean. There you go, find a boat, build a boat, sail across the ocean. And so he got the sailing bug, got uh, you know familiar with the boat and how to do it, and then uh, headed south to Africa. But before he left, he uh, was told, you know, gee, you ought to get some ham radio equipment so you can talk to people while you're out there. This was in the uh, early 50s and there were no sat phones or anything. So he said, yeah, that might be a good idea. So he got licensed and put some equipment on it, uh, the boat, and this is serious equipment uh, with handles and, and panels and all this kind of stuff, and uh, started talking to people as he made his way from uh, England down to the west coast of Africa and then started across the Atlantic Ocean headed for North America. There were three Yasmi boats. Okay, the first one uh, was the one that he uh, rebuilt. It was a 50 footer, uh, which is not a big boat to be sailing uh, on the ocean blue. 10 horsepower motor, very small motor, a little putt putt kind of a motor. And it had a single mast and he called it his yacht. He crossed from Gambia to the British West Indies. And as we all know from watching the hurricane uh, weather prediction, that is a very uh, good route for winds, the trade winds that blow from east to west, blow from West Africa into the Caribbean. So he took advantage of that. And he sailed uh, quite extensively on uh, the ASME uh, as part of his you know, de-expeditioning and whatnot, uh, but it sank on a reef in the Gulf of Papua, which is out in the Pacific. And this was kind of an interesting story. Uh, those are shark infested waters in the Coral Sea. And he was rescued by the Australian Navy, not unlike the Jaws movie, um, where he was clinging to the mast with most of the boat under the water and he could actually see the sharks giving him the eye. So he was glad to see the, the Navy show up. So then he built another, uh, he bought another boat, uh, approximately the same size, uh, Yasmi 1.5. But uh, during the rebuilding and retrofitting process, uh, the fuel leak or something, it, it blew up and burned and sank in Holyhead Harbor. So this is beginning to sound a little Monty Python-esque about building the castle in the swamp and it sank into the swamp. Well, he built another castle and then it fell over and sank into the swamp. And then a castle that, that caught on fire and fell over and uh, sank into the swamp. Well, uh, Danny was having some trouble with the Yasmis, but he finally got Yasmi 2 um, put together and sailed that around in the Caribbean and other places. But uh, he, he fell asleep uh, trying to get from one point to another and uh, foundered on rocks off Grenada, which is now J3. Um, back in those days, in the 50s, the Caribbean was not the uh, tourist friendly uh, area that we think of today, where you can just hop on a boat or cruise ships are all over the place or fly a plane to these islands. Uh, a lot of them had not been on the air and were not really highly populated. So this was kind of dangerous business. And finally, Yasmi 3 um, was obtained and sailed around even more ham radio stuff. And finally, in 63, he decided he'd had enough. After about nine years of doing this, he was the first serial de-expeditioner. There had been de-expeditions before by Bob Dennison, W0DX, and uh, the famous Mountains of the Moon uh, expedition led by Bob Leo after World War II. But uh, there hadn't been anybody doing uh, the island hopping thing yet. So this was Danny's innovation. The ASME 3 was sold in Freeport and it was still seaworthy at the time. So let's chalk that one up as a, as a success here, here. Um, he operated from 31 different island countries. Many were on the air for the very first time, even in the Caribbean. Uh, there were a lot of VP this and uh, uh, various other call signs that had not been activated. So these were all time new ones, uh, pretty, pretty hot items. And um, he pioneered what we now uh, think of as the worldwide de-expedition and all that came after him 
are um, in debt to uh, in debt to Danny for defining this. If you get a chance, um, if you'll hold on for one minute, I'm going to grab this book. Ah, here it is. I think I have a slide on this, but in case I don't, this Yasme book is a really wonderful compilation of all these Danny Weil stories, plus a lot of stuff about Don Miller and Gus Browning and all these guys that you've heard about. I got my license in 71 uh, and then the ticket showed up in 72. And that was just as Don Miller was finally uh, coming to a consent decree with the league and all this stuff had gone by and I didn't know anything about what had happened. If you're in that boat, um, I strongly suggest that you download the book, which is now free from the YASME website, yasme.org, as a PDF. It's fascinating reading. You'll meet a lot of characters who you've heard of, but not, never met. And uh, it is the period in which the modern DX um, CC program and other DXing traditions were established. Danny's last operation was from Fiji as VR2EO. He made more than 100,000 QSOs all by himself. No spotting networks, no electronic keyers. It was all manual uh, Morse code. And so this was quite an effort. He was the fifth in the CQDX Hall of Fame and he finally uh, died in October. 2003, by all accounts, a happy man. And he was interviewed by Jim Kane, K1TN, the uh, author of the ASME book, extensively uh, for the book. And uh, uh, Jim just speaks incredibly fondly of Danny. Of course, Danny traveled around uh, the U.S. raising funds for the uh, for the trips. And you can see him here at the 1958 uh, Dayton Hamvention getting a good grilling from Al Hicks, uh, who became W8AH, uh, well known for his exceptionally strong signal. And uh, Harold Stryker, W8WZ, two top DXers at the time, no doubt asking Danny, where do you go next? So in 1959, it became pretty obvious as Danny went through boats and QSLs and, and incurred quite a, a bit of expense um, that he could use a hand. And so the ASME Foundation was established. Uh, initially, uh, Herb, uh, uh, Richard Dick Spencey, Dick, sorry about that, Dick Spencey, KV4AA, was the uh, mastermind behind all this. You can see, um, you can see him at his uh, extensive station there with the big Globe King and uh, Collins receivers and Johnson transmitters and all that. Um, and if you got any of these, I think there were four issues of the ASME News. Those are uh, also available on the website. So it was basically to fund the expedition, cover his expenses, answer QSL requests, all that stuff. So Danny could keep out there doing what he loved, which was sailing and uh, ham radioing. And DXers would contribute five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever. Um, there were originally about 2,500 initial members um, and uh, the membership drive kept the foundation alive into the early 60s. And uh, the Yasme news that you can see there uh, was how they communicated with each other. No Facebook, no web pages. Well, as part of all this and two of the other characters that you would meet in the Yasme book, um, associated with DXing were the Colvins, uh, Lloyd and Iris. Uh, Lloyd was W6KG, originally W7KG, and Iris became W6QL. And um, they uh, became part of the foundation. They were uh, members of the board. And Lloyd retired from military service and had a construction business in 1963, about the time that Danny uh, hung up his uh, headphones, so to speak. And they were very active DXers. They could travel because they uh, were independently wealthy from the sale of the business. And in 1964, they were wondering what to do with, um, with all this uh, Dan uh, Danny Weil stuff. And should they disband the foundation? What should they do? Iris uttered the fateful words, why don't we go in 1964? Well, um, and you can see a picture there. Uh, Lloyd and Iris met in Germany after World War II. Um, she worked for 
the uh, U.S. Uh, State Department, I think, and he was part of the Signal Corps, and uh, they hit it right off. And there they are in 1993, 30 years and 223 countries visited later. Uh, they have quite a tale, and I think they operated from 169 of them. Um, all of that is documented in the ASME book. So they sold the ASME 3, and nothing was happening. So the Colvins decided to go ahead, and yes, they would go. And so in 1965, they reanimated and refocused the foundation to manage all of their de-expeditions. They didn't need travel expenses, but they did need um, a stable home for uh, business-related activities and QSL cards and all this kind of stuff. Who was going to treat the, the logs properly and all that kind of thing. So the foundation began to handle donations and contribution and began accumulating an endowment um, in the mid-60s. And they made more than a million QSOs while they were out there. Again, this is for the days of computer-driven uh, logging and multi uh, station the expedition. So this is all by a couple of people, 500,000 each. You can see a couple of the famous Yasmi cards there, one from um, uh, Mauritania and another one from uh, Mozambique. And they all kind of look like that. I bet some of the audience members have a few of these in their, uh, in their QSL card collection. They did, yes, 169 countries and the stop number one, out there in the Pacific, Tarawa, VR1Z at the time, part of the British Line Islands. It's now uh, part of uh, Kiribati and uh, T30. Well, that was uh, a hard place to get to. Uh, it was not easy to get to in 1965, so, or 66, I guess it was. And you can see down there a signature of our senior director, Bob, W6RGG. Most of you have probably seen a picture of Bob uh, perched on a rock at Scarborough Reef, staring into a box, a plywood box that's mounted on a scaffold as he busily works the deserving from BS7H. But he was uh, part of the foundation back in 1966. So he's been at this um, coming up on 60 years, just in the ASME Foundation. There's those million QSOs. All QSLs were answered 100%. And uh, so they received more than 750,000 cards. And uh, so they uh, were doing this right. And so all of them are alphabetized in QSL book uh, order. And uh, if you go to the document, it's called DocuFunk, the uh, Documentary Archives Radio Communications. Docu means documentary, and funk is the German word for radio. So documenting radio collection in Vienna, Austria. And you can go in there and there's the ASME room and it has a number of Lloyd's uh, trophies from various competitions, it has some photos and all of those cards are in there. They had kept them all in these great drawers and um, these were in a, a storage garage when I started with the ASME Foundation. And finally we found a good way to um, take care of them forever and made a, donation of the cards and uh, some uh, money to maintain them to this, uh, this great museum. Highly recommended. They have a terrific online presence as well. There's a uh, slide of the book. I knew I had one. Uh, Lloyd died from a stroke on the final expedition, his final expedition in December of 1993. And at that point, Irish decided to shut it down as well. Um, they made a sizable bequest to the ARL, which established the Colvin Award, which is awarded every year to uh, a, a highly thought of expedition. And then uh, Iris finally died in 1998. The Colvin Family Trust sold an apartment building and uh, established the current Yasme Foundation Endowment. So uh, the Colvins have been instrumental all the way along in establishing the foundation funding it and creating uh, a resource for the amateur radio community well into the future. So let's talk about where the ASME Foundation is today. This is our masthead. You can see the ASME there and our PO box in Castro Valley, but most of what you would get uh, from the ASME is available on the ASME website. And I will reiterate that the ASME book is available 
uh, for free download from the website. So as we stand today, we are self-funded. We do not uh, require or encourage donations or subscriptions. Uh, this simplifies matters greatly for us. We are required by um, IRS law to spend a certain amount of money uh, from the income that we make on the investment portfolio. And that's what funds YASME operations. The nine current directors are, who are all volunteers are myself as president. I joined in 2004. Uh, Bob uh, Valia is our senior member, W6OAT, Rusty. I'm sure many of you have worked him in contests and from various D expeditions of his own. The uh, inimitable Marty Lane, OH2BH. Fred Lown, K3ZO, with a long string of DX calls of his own. PB2T is Hans Zimmerman from uh, Holland, and uh, he's also an IARU um, officer. K4ZW, Ken Clairbout, is, uh, uh, works for the Voice of America and is our treasury, uh, is our uh, uh, secretary and vice president. Rusty is our treasurer. N6VI, Marty Wall. Uh, former ARL vice director is uh, one of our new directors and nine Victor one Yankee Charlie, another frequently worked call sign for many D expeditions. James is also a wonderful videographer. And if you can go out and find the uh, videos online, I believe they're all online now for free access. They're wonderful. My favorite is the A52A um, tape, but there are tapes from Clipperton, and uh, all kinds of different places, ZL9 and various other major D expeditions. So if you're looking for club programs about DX, uh, you could certainly do worse than find some of James's uh, videos. And they're also available from the Northern California DX Foundation. The ASME Foundation is a private operating foundation. That's the official title. We're incorporated in California. So we uh, uh, abide by all of those rules as well as the IRS. We make supporting grants. We have an excellence award program and we also have the YASME plaque and YASME trophy programs, which I'll describe later. Our supporting grants, um, basically this is just direct assistance to individuals and organizations. It's usually a one-time award. Um, they are to support the cost of a project, perhaps travel expenses, operating costs. Uh, somebody needs some equipment, somebody uh, you know, needs um, some software or what have you. We find out about it and uh, we do a little due diligence and we make the award. We can, um, we can accept applications, but generally it's us going out and beating the bushes and finding out uh, good things to support. So we don't really solicit them. Every once in a while, we'll get a, an application for a grant, but they're generally not um, amateur radio type grants. And so uh, they, don't, they don't get funded. We do make grants to other charitable organizations as well. For example, the ARL and uh, FAR get donations every year for scholarships. And so there's a YASME scholarship for both of those. That's the ARL Foundation and the Friendship uh, Amateur Radio Foundation. We also make grants to WRTC organizers. Uh, the youngsters on the air groups get uh, some funding. And we have supported uh, organizations like the Northern California DX Foundations uh, when they uh, redid all of the hardware and software for the International Beacon Project. YASME made a substantial donation to help with that but we don't fund the expedition. So if you're planning on going to Betuwana land, um, uh, don't bother to send a, uh, uh, an application for uh, support grant because we don't do that. There's lots and lots of organizations that do, DX clubs, Northern California DX Foundation, Indexa, Chiltern DX Club, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they, they are the primary funding for the expeditions. Here's some examples of recent grants. Um, for example, this travel, um, we, uh, we supported the travel expenses for the South Sudanese uh, Telecommunications Department representative to go to the African meeting of the IARU in order to learn about amateur radio regulations. At the time, South Sudan was just becoming a new country. 
they had to establish all this infrastructure that uh, we sort of take for granted. Well, uh, they didn't have a Department of Telecommunications, so they couldn't give out ham radio licenses. We can't have that. So um, they had a ham radio regulation workshop in, um, I think it was Ghana. And so we paid for the rep to go there, learn about amateur radio regulations, get a sample set of them, bring them back. And lo and behold, the Z8 call sign uh, was on the air. Tools uh, will support uh, things like software tools. Um, we bought radios for the NCDXF uh, beacon network. These are things, uh, projects, need help uh, purchasing stuff to do some useful thing for ham radio. We bought um, a bunch of stuff for the ARISS update of the uh, VHF, UHF radios on board the ISS, for example. So uh, when somebody says, gee, uh, we're doing great here, but we can't afford a design seat for the software, or we need radios, or we need something um, that's right in Yasmi's wheelhouse. We also support systems. Uh, recently, uh, Phil's uh, familiar with this. We uh, supported expansion of RBN nodes in underserved areas around the world. And um, we are getting uh, two new ones. Two new ones are coming along in um, Echo Yankee, Tajikistan, and um, Puerto Rico at the, uh, the big, what was the observatory? And it's still actually observatory, but the big dish kind of got munged there. Um, Angel WP3R is uh, putting up a node there. There were no nodes in uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, no deer, Echo Yankee 8 Mike Mike is doing the RBN node in Tajikistan. So we've established uh, several nodes across the eastern part of Russia, all the way out to Siberia, and uh, two in the Pacific and a couple in the Caribbean. So if you can find a, a big hole in the map and somebody who will host an RBN node, let me know. We know how to do this now. Um, we're also big on supporting youth activity. Uh, so we've been supporting things like uh, Yoda activities and expenses like the recent camp in region two. Um, the, uh, uh, the camps all uh, basically, they want a minimum expense for the campers. So the campers only have to pay 100 euros or 100 bucks or something. And um, uh, so to cover all their expenses, we'll make a donation to that. Yoda and associated youth activities are a very good thing. And uh, we need to uh, support those across the board. DX activity, we like to make sure there's DX stations on the air because that raises the profile of amateur radio around the world. Uh, for example, after the floods in Bangkok, we helped HS0 stay on the air because their station had been destroyed. All of it was ruined uh, by the water. And uh, so Seychelles uh, Amateur Radio uh, or Association is building a station that will allow all of their members to operate from remote uh, sites around the Seychelles Island. And uh, so maybe some S79 calls will be very active in the future. So we're helping with that. More, uh, more grants, uh, we uh, supported WRTCs, uh, they're a good thing. ARL and FAR scholarships, like I said, uh, we made a donation to Clublog to help uh, Michael update the server. That's a very successful program. And uh, we're working with the ARDC, the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Group um, uh, to support donations to uh, groups that are not, um, organized as official foundations. For example, this link repeater projects in uh, the Virgin Islands after the 2017 hurricanes, uh, they embarked on a project led by Fred Kleber, uh, K9VV, who you probably worked as NP2X. Fred is a ex Motorola communications employee and he's really seized the initiative down there and brought their emergency communications up to snuff and they've linked all four islands now by repeaters. And so the ARDC made a grant through YASME to complete that project. And they're in the process of putting that together now. We also made a grant to a Rwandan girls school uh, program that's sponsored by um, a university in, I think Boston University. And um, uh, so we are providing teacher access to the ARL's Institute videos and a big package of books for the girls there. They already had a maker space 
And uh, it's really amazing uh, what they're accomplishing there. So the teacher was very interested in amateur radio. So we jumped on that. And there's an FRS uh, package of bright pink radios that got sent to Peru to help train young people on how to use a radio so that they will then see the value of ham radio and uh, go on. So they're basically using the FRS to train people on how to use a radio. If you've never used a two-way radio, you don't get what amateur radio really is all about. So you need to learn how to use one of these little walkabout things. And then you start to understand push to talk and how to hold it and how the antenna should be oriented. All these things that we take for granted as experienced ham radio operators, that's got to come from someplace. So there's a group in Peru that's training youngsters with these radios. On our excellence award, um, we try to recognize people who are kind of under the radar. You know, there's a lot of uh, high power stars. Uh, you see them all the time on the websites and the news articles and things like that. And they're well known and recognized. There's a lot more people who are working tirelessly without a lot of recognition to uh, promote amateur radio, do good things through ham radio, uh, all these, all these uh, different little projects. And so we try to find these people and uh, who are making a significant contribution. And we give them one of these nice crystal globes. It's one of the nicer trophies that I've seen in amateur radio. And we cut them a check. And that uh, combination of uh, here's some money and here's a nice uh, prize really uh, gets some attention. So this is a picture of HS2, JFW, and E21 EIC. They did tremendous work in reestablishing the Thailand Amateur Radio Licensing Program. And they worked and they worked and they worked and it took years. Finally, the HF license exam is being given again. You're hearing more Thai uh, licensees on the air. They have a tremendous number of VHF only licensees and many of them are interested in HF. So by reestablishing the license program, the test hadn't been given in 20 years. Um, you're starting to see a lot more activity from Thailand and those guys really deserved it. Our most recent excellence award is uh, BE6 WZ. Steve uh, is really well known for his low band antenna system design and remote uh, operating. He's made a tremendous contribution there. So check out his website, just Google the call, you'll find it. We recognize um, Angel WP3R uh, after the earthquake, uh, after the uh, hurricane and then the earthquake in Puerto Rico, uh, Angel was instrumental in uh, making the uh, observatory a center for emergency and disaster response. He's trained so many people on amateur radio. Uh, he's just a force uh, in the western half of the island. So uh, he got the award. Uh, we've also given awards. Uh, you can see they go all over the world. Croatia, uh, New England, there's uh, Fred K9VV. Uh, uh, for his work in uh, uh, the Virgin Islands. Uh, Stu K6TU has put uh, the HFTA data collection process, which was a pain in the neck, to put it lightly. Now you can enter your coordinates and get the data set almost instantaneously. Um, Stu's made that all available. Uh, Zorro JH1AJT uh, does humanitarian projects associated with amateur radio all over the world. And we wanted to recognize uh, the WSJT team. Uh, we've also recognized N1MM's uh, development team. These guys are doing great stuff. It's, um, it's pro bono and needs to be recognized. So that's typical of our excellence awards. For those of you that are into collecting uh, interesting things for your shack, we have the ASME plaque and trophy. Um, if you can submit QSL cards or a, at least a list of them showing contacts with YASME officers, directors, or YASME operations, and there is a large uh, PDF uh, downloadable list on the website. If you've got 30 YASME uh, contacts in your log, you can get that nice plaque um, on the left. And I uh, assign these things regularly and send them back out. Who signed that one? That was Wayne Mills, uh, N7NG, one of our former presidents, and uh, Randy White, our uh, awards manager. And then on the right, if you make 60 contacts, you can get this nice little replica of the Yasmi herself. 
And I don't know of too many amateur radio uh, awards that look like a real boat. So start checking your logs and look at those lists of uh, operations from the directors and otherwise you may be pleasantly surprised. So what are we doing tomorrow? As Marty would say, where do we go next? Well, we wanna update the awards programs. Uh, we're working on a couple other ideas. We haven't announced them yet to recognize uh, extraordinary achievements uh, that are kind of out there at the moment. But if somebody's working on them and eventually breaks through, we would give them a prize. You've heard of the X prize. Uh, that's kind of in the same line, but we haven't quite figured out how to do that um, appropriately yet. We wanna continue our supporting grants. We have to give away this money every year and we are delighted in how many good projects there are out there to uh, support and the Excellence Awards program will continue. We are very much into the opening of ham radio around the world. There's a lot of countries like Thailand where ham radio is sort of moribund or there's kind of an old guard that kind of treats it as their own private hobby and uh, doesn't really want to open it up. Uh, we've worked with several groups to help bring the old and the young together and to reanimate amateur radio. For example, uh, Tunisia is one of those uh, places and Algeria as well. So um, wherever we can lend a hand to uh, open up AM radio, we'll give it a try. And then this new infrastructure and technology that's going out there, RBN nodes, linked repeaters, all this kind of stuff. Uh, we're very much into that. That's uh, a key element of ham radio. I frequently heard to say science service skill. Um, so science is good. Sci uh, the ham side folks are doing wonderful things. Uh, I, I made the uh, wistful observation about the personal space weather station some years ago. And by golly, it's uh, about uh, ready to go. So watch out for that. Uh, all kinds of interesting technology is out there. And we wanna promote on the air activity everywhere. All these OTA groups, OTA, youngsters on the air, islands on the air, parks on the air. I don't know uh, if you guys are into the parks on the air program. These people are rabid. They are out there. There were 62 parks on the air at one time this morning. I heard a couple of guys on my local repeater talking about it. And it's getting people on the air who otherwise would not be on the air. They, they don't have a big station. They can't work DX. Um, so they've discovered that uh, they can go out to a park with a portable setup and a small antenna, and they can be DX for a day. And it's great fun. And then everybody chases them. And it's almost like the old county hunters, but uh, now it's uh, parks. So we're promoting that. All, anything with OTA gets my uh, vote of approval. And we try to remember that ham radio is made up of, of individuals. Um, that means we're not so much enamored of the various big organizations, they can take care of themselves. Uh, we're looking for one-on-one -on -one people doing things that help ham radio. And we want people themselves to be on ham radio, whether that's with their own station, with a club station, or with a remote station. Uh, we just want them to be on the air and active. And uh, DX is, those of you who've been around for a while have heard that expression. That was from Hugh Cassidy, WA6AUD, who wrote the West Coast DX Bulletin and from which many of our uh, jargon, jargony bits come from. Hugh, uh, uh, he would always say, um, DX is. You get on the air and you work it. It's every day is different. You get out there. The ionosphere is constantly changing. The sun is constantly changing. Who's where, who's on the air today. There's always something out there to work. So we're trying to keep, carry that forward. That, that spirit of, I love this ham radio stuff. Uh, into the 21st century. So that's basically the presentation.